Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we wrap up our series on agriculture. Final topic for the day is going to be agribusiness. So as I always say, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe and discuss the major components of agribusiness and explain multiple sustainable agricultural techniques. That's what we've got. Let's go ahead and start talking about some stuff. The video today is going to focus on the topic of agribusiness and sustainable agriculture. And the reason that we're going to talk about this is we have seen a major shift in agriculture over probably the last 50 years or so. We've moved from a place where agriculture was the primary business of feeding people, getting food for your family, maybe some food for your neighbors, maybe some food to trade. But it wasn't really looked at as a way to make substantial profits. People may have made a living, but nobody was getting rich off it. After the Green Revolution and the introduction of mechanization and all those other techniques that we talked about, we started to move towards agribusiness where you have got large commercial operations using all of the industrial techniques that they can find to maximize the output of the land and thus their profits. So we moved to a place where we went from producing food for trade and for feeding people to producing food for profits, which led to a significant shift in the way that we look at agriculture. And it led to some techniques that I'm gonna go ahead and talk about. And one of them is the CAFO. CAFO stands for a concentrated animal feeding operation. Basically what it is, is a method of raising animals, particularly this is done with chicken, beef, and pigs. But it's raising animals in a way that limits the space that they use and maximizes profits. And on a CAFO, essentially what you see is a bunch of animals in a very small confined space. M many times that space is indoors, like the chickens we see here. Often pig farming operations are done with the animals indoors. With cows, you've got them crowded onto feedlots. And what this technique does is it lets you put a lot of animals on a little bit of space. It also maxim or minimizes the amount of movement that the animals are able to make. So this means that they are not using up as much energy to get around so you can feed them less. Now some problems that come out of this situation. If you've got a bunch of animals crowded together like this in an area then obviously the transmission of diseases is going to be a big problem for you. So CAFO operations tend to use a lot of antibiotics. Those antibiotics and hormones can cause two problems. One, they make it into the meat supply and there's been a lot of talk about the impacts of people eating meats that have got hormones and antibiotics and also those antibiotics and hormones come out in the urine of the animals which makes it into the water supply which leads me to the next big problem which is waste. Um, concentrated animal feeding operations for cows can produce thousands and thousands of tons of waste a year. One CAFO with cows on it may produce as much waste in a year as a town of 5,000 people. So Dealing with that waste is going to be a big problem, and as we talked about previously, there is the option of using a manure lagoon, but as we also talked about, those can crack and leak into groundwater supplies. If it rains, they can overflow, so there are some big problems that go along with CAFOs. They do produce a bunch of food at a cheap price, but they are not good for the animals and they are not good for the environment. The alternative to a CAFO is the idea of free ranging, which is basically letting the animal do what it was built to do. If you got chickens, you let them free range out in the barnyard. If you got cows, they have pasture land that they can wander through. Pigs have pastures and they have forests. Um, it is a sustainable option because you are not concentrating the animals onto a single area. They're allowed to do what they would naturally do. You're not buying food for them because they are eating the grass and forage that they would normally eat. You're not buying antibiotics and hormones for them because they are spread out, they're not packed together, so disease isn't nearly as big of a problem. It's a lot easier on the land. Their waste gets spread out across the land rather than being concentrated into a small area. The one drawback of free-ranging animals is that production is lower because you are not cramming a bunch of animals together into one place, and often costs are higher because it is not as efficient. I'm gonna go ahead and move from land animals to fish in the sea, and we need to talk about fish with regard to the environment because there has been a significant change in world fisheries. A fishery is an area of water where the fish can be obtained economically. Um, 
the fisheries around the world have changed dramatically in the last 50 years or so. Presently, 30% of global fisheries are on the verge of collapse. So that means that those places in the world have lost 90% of their fish population. Around the world, most fisheries are in danger, but like I just said, a third of world fisheries are on the verge of collapse. So people are taking fish out of the water at an unprecedented rate, and the ecosystems of the ocean are suffering greatly for it. So I just said that um, fish are being taken away a lot more quickly. Let's talk about why that is. Back in the day, before modern technology, people went fishing with cast nets that they'd like stand on the shore and toss out in the water. They might have had rowboats. They could have had small sailboats, maybe uh, fishing poles, but no techniques for catching tons and tons of fish at a time. We have now moved to a place where you've got big factory ships that can go out to ocean for months at a time, do all their processing of the fish on the water, freeze that fish, and thus increase the amount of fish that they can take. You've got giant nets that can be dragged behind these container ships. You could have nets that are a quarter mile long dragging through the ocean. You've also got long lining, which is a situation where a huge long line is strung out with hundreds or thousands of baited hooks on it. So obviously that's going to be much quicker than one guy with a fishing pole. You've got purse seams, which is a technique where you encircle a school of fish with a net and then you pull a drawstring on the top and it closes it up like a purse. It can catch as many as 3,000 tuna at a time. There are drag nets, which are dragged behind a fishing boat. Um, a drag net is used to catch bottom dwelling uh, sea critters, sea critters, like uh, shrimp and clams and things like that. Problem with a dragnet is it drags across the bottom of the ocean and wrecks everything on the bottom of the ocean. So any coral that's down there, plant life, um, sensitive sea creatures that are bottom dwelling, it's good because you can get the shrimp that you're after, but it also messes up the ecosystem on the bottom of the ocean. A couple of the problems with all of these techniques beyond the fact that it's catching fish much quicker than they can reproduce. You got the damage of sensitive ecosystems like coral reefs, like I just talked about. Keystone species, unfortunately, are the ones we like to eat, but we talked about keystone species being pulled out of an environment and leading to the collapse of an ecosystem. So some keystone species that are commonly fished include tuna and swordfish, big, important to their ecosystems, but also humans like them, so we overfish them. And then there's the biggest problem, which is bycatch. When you are fishing, you got your target species, and then there is everything else. A lot of these techniques that fishermen use are not specific, so they kind of catch just about everything. And what a fisherman will do is it'll go through, they'll pull out the fish that they were after, and then they'll toss everything overboard. Problem is, everything that gets tossed overboard has probably been in a net long enough that it is dead. Some fishing operations can produce something like 75 to 90 percent bycatch, which means you catch all of this stuff, you only use about 10 or 15 percent of it, and then you toss everything else overboard. So all these techniques are rough for the environment. As with many other food production techniques, a lot of people are talking about moving towards sustainable fishing. Um, fishing is a problem of tragedy of commons, like we've talked about previously, the idea that if there aren't any regulations, if an area can be accessed by everybody, people tend to overuse it. That's the ocean. There aren't any firm boundaries that say, this is where one country's waters start and the other one stops. People can move easily, fish swim back and forth, so nobody really has specific incentive to say, I'm going to protect my water, I'm going to manage it sustainably. So there have been a couple of movements to help things out. In 1996, uh, the American government passed the Sustainable Fisheries Act, which moved towards a conservation approach to managing fisheries, um, hoping to help fisheries recover over time, both for the environment and for the fishermen. <clears throat> There's also been some attempt to use individual transferable quotas, which basically says to a fisherman, you can catch this much fish, you may not go over your quota, but if you stay under it, you can sell some of what you have not caught, some of your quota to another fisherman. So it's kind of like the cap and trade idea that we've talked about previously. Since the individual transferable quotas have been implemented in America, some fish stocks have recovered pretty significantly. Um, these have also been used with some success in New Zealand. <clears throat> Another technique for producing fish without actually pulling them out of the water is aquaculture, which is more commonly known as fish farming. Um, it's growing fish in an enclosed area, either in pools that have been constructed on land or in cages out in the water, as you see there. It is good for fish stocks. It is a good viable option for producing 
food for people that need food, though it does have some environmental consequences. Uh, obviously, fish need water, so a lot of times with an aquaculture situation, you'll see fresh water being pumped in one end, it goes through the process, it gets filled with food and fish waste and antibiotics and whatever, and then it gets pumped back out the other end into the body of the water. So clean water is entering, terribly polluted water is exiting on the other side. They're also um, energy intensive, and a lot of times, in order to feed the fish, you have to go out and catch other fish. So you're catching fish, grinding them up, and feeding them to the fish that you are raising. So aquaculture might be a viable option for producing a lot of fish, but it does have some environmental challenges that go along with it. And we're gonna wrap up this section of this video by talking about some small scale problems. By small scale, I mean that these are problems that aren't associated with large scale farming operations. These are problems that occur in areas that have uh, relatively nutrient poor soil, so the soil doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it. One of the biggest problems is going to be slash and burn agriculture. This is a technique where an area of land is cut down, the trees that have been cut down are burned, and then the land is farmed. Obviously, trees got to be cut down so you have room for the farming, but the trees are burned so that the nutrients that are in the trees get down into the soil. The problem with this kind of agriculture is one, as you're burning all of that vegetation, you're releasing carbon dioxide and other pollutants into the atmosphere. Two, there are nutrients that are put back into the soil, but once planted, those nutrients go away very quickly. So slash and burn farms only last for a couple of years, and then the farmers have to move on to somewhere else, cut another batch of forest, and the process starts all over again. This can lead to a process called desertification, which basically is a situation where the vegetation in an area disappears, can't hold down the soil anymore, topsoil starts blowing away, and you no longer can use that land for productive farming. Desertification can also be caused by overgrazing of animals. So this is going to lead us to our major debate, conventional farming versus sustainable agriculture. A lot of people point to conventional farming and say, if we are going to feed the world, we need to use these conventional farming techniques that include mechanization and pesticides and monocropping and all that stuff. That's how we're going to get enough food for the world. But then there are people that say, well, but what about the environment? We should be looking at sustainable practices so that we don't wreck our environment that's providing the food that we need. So just like everything else we've talked about with environmental science, there is a constant tension between those who say, hey, let's look at the environment, and then those who say, hey, look at humanity. humanity. We need help. I'm going to wrap up this little talk with uh, some sustainable farming practices that you should be aware of. One of them is nomadic grazing. A lot of sustainable techniques go back to the way farming was done back in the day. So nomadic gra grazing is just moving with the seasons. Rather than staying in one area where your animals could completely overgraze the land, you follow the rains and you follow the grasses. And wherever there is grass, that's where you graze your animals. Now, obviously, this is a time-consuming process. It would be hard to move large herds and large flocks this way, but it is a technique that's used in a lot of parts of the world. Other techniques that you need to be aware of is using animal waste as fertilizer. It's been used for centuries and centuries and centuries before we had synthetic fertilizers. It has been shown to be effective, so that is one viable option for fertilizer. There is intercropping, which is an technique where you grow multiple cr crops on one plot of land rather than monocropping where you've just got a single pl uh, type of uh, vegetation growing, so all corn, all wheat, all grain, whatever. You grow multiple crops in one area, which has multiple benefits. One, you have a variety of plants growing. This brings a variety of bugs, so you can attract good bugs that will help to control the bad bugs. Also, some plants provide nutrients to the soil that other plants need, so corn needs nitrogen peas as they are growing, they fix nitrogen and put it into the soil. So you grow peas and corn together, the peas provide the nitrogen that your corn needs. <clears throat> crop rotation is basically the same idea, where you rotate the crop that is grown on a plot of land each year. Um, this confuses the pests, so you can't have one pest kind of taken over an area because pests are going to be crop specific. So no one pest can really get a foothold. Also, you can enrich the soil by planting certain crops at certain times. Agroforestry is an interesting technique where you've got trees and plants planted together. Trees attract birds, birds eat bugs, so it helps to take care of your crops. Also, those trees can provide a windbreak to reduce erosion, and they provide firewood for the people. Contour plowing is a technique that's used to reduce erosion, and the way this works is rather than just plowing straight lines up and down the land that wind can get a good run on, 
you plow with the contour of the land and this technique basically reduces wind erosion one because the lines aren't lined up directly with the way the winds blowing also when it rains the water runs off the land along the contours and contour plowing can kind of stop some of that runoff so contour plowing know that that is aimed at reducing erosion as is no-till agriculture most agriculture relies on a technique called tilling where you run a machine over the soil and it basically flips the soil upside down this kills off weeds it kills off bug larva um, so it takes care of some of that stuff but it also leaves the soil bare and you're turning up soil which means that it is sustainable to erosion from wind and water also when you turn that soil over it changes decomposition and releases a bunch of greenhouse gases so you can treat a farm to no-till agriculture, which basically means that all of the farm waste from one year to the next is left in the soil and it decomposes down into the soil. And you just plant your new crop on top of it and it grows up through the waste from the previous year. One of the rough things with no-till agriculture is weeds can become a problem, so it may increase the use of pesticides. So, in a situation like this, a lot of farmers will look at integrated pest management, which is kind of an all of the above approach. Integrated pest management basically looks at what techniques can a farmer use to reduce the application of pesticides. So it kind of involves all of the techniques we have just talked about. It uses intercropping and no-till agriculture. It uses beneficial insects to control harmful insects. It's basically a very observational based approach where the farmer is intimately aware of what's going on in his farm and what his plants need and he only uses pesticides if absolutely necessary. So it does involve some pesticide use but it is kind of a last resort. And we're going to wrap up with organic agriculture because I'm sure you've probably had this in the back of your head the whole time I've been talking today. So some major principles of organic agriculture is the main kind of overarching idea of it is that you work with nature rather than dominating nature. Conventional agriculture, agribusiness, whatever you want to call it, is all about dominating nature. Lots of machines, lots of chemicals. You are going to bend nature to your will. Organic agriculture basically looks at how can we work with nature to get done what we need to get done. It works to keep organic matter and nutrients in the soil. So one of the major concerns of organic agriculture is going to be soil quality. And that's something that farmers are going to focus on. And then the big one, no synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. So if you're going to grow stuff organically, you can't use chemicals on it or you can't use synthetic chemicals on it. Also, I should add it in there um, to have the organic label, at least in America, it can also not contain genetically modified organisms. So no GMOs synthetic pesticides or synthetic fertilizers. Organic farmers also work to increase the mass of the soil, so they want to put organic material back into the soil so it is sustainable from one season to the next. Finally, they want to reduce the adverse environmental effect of agriculture. Agricultural, agriculture is likely the most environmentally impactful practice that humans do to the land. So organic agriculture recognizes people need food, but let's try to do it without harming the environment so much. Now, the major argument against organ organic agriculture is that all of these techniques are time consuming. The production may not be quite as high and they are expensive. So organic agriculture is available to the set of the population that is willing to pay a premium for organic food, but it may not be readily available to everyone. Also, people argue that these organic agricultural techniques may not produce enough food to feed the world. So it goes back to that people versus environment debate. And with that, that is your crash course into agribusiness and sustainable agriculture. That's the end of our series on agriculture. My name is Mr. Kite. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. Hopefully we'll see you again.